Howdy, everybody. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on a Thursday, August 6th. Frank Stamfel back in action after a slight power outage. Hope everybody in the Northeast is doing well. Joining me, as always, is Chris Towers and host... Hey. Scott White, great job holding it down last night. Big thanks to the Welsh who came on and came through for us. So appreciate that. Scott, you want to take Did over you just call him the Walsh? The Walsh? The Welsh? I thought the I called Welsh. him the Welsh. Yeah. It's the Welsh. Come on. I know the Come Welsh. On, I've been listening to the Welsh for years, man. Big fan. Scott, I'll just <laughs> hand over the host mic to you, man. What do you want to do today? What do I want to? I, I, I did not come prepared for this, Frank. I am not taking your job, believe it or not. This should be a, a great relief to you, I would think. Uh, no, you're, you're, you're ready to host again. You have power back, and uh, I'm ready to just be a run of the mill panelist. Just for the record, if anyone wants to do my job, feel free. <laughs> come on, Chris. I'll still get paid for it, but if you want to do the work, by all means, take it away. We'll see. We'll see what we can do. See if we get any takers. 16-game slate on the schedule on Wednesday Woo. night. Let's jump right back in. I'm back, and I don't know if I'm back by popular demand, but uh, Susan is also back by popular demand. I asked for your feedback. Most people enjoy. Oh, my goodness gracious. So with that, let's get it started. Oh, my good, goodness, goodness gracious. gracious. <laughs> Scott, I'm not sure if you missed that, but it doesn't really matter because she's here to stay. Who is your, oh my goodness gracious, player of the night? I'm going to go with Kyle Tucker, actually, oh, here. He didn't it, take the good one. It, it, <laughs> I, I didn't. I, I was being generous to you guys. Kyle Tucker uh, started a game against a lefty, that lefty being Robbie Ray. It was the second consecutive day that Kyle Tucker started against the lefty, the first two times he's done that all year. And in this particular game against Robbie Ray, he hit a home run. So how to make friends and influence people, people being specifically Dusty Baker. I think Kyle Tucker is, is doing it now as well as he can. He actually had two hits in that other game he started against the lefty. So like Dusty Baker was afraid to start him against lefties. Well, he shouldn't have much fear of doing that anymore. And you know, if, when Jordan Alvarez gets back, Kyle Tucker has continued to make statements with the playing time he's gotten. I don't see how Dusty Baker keeps him out of the lineup. Josh Reddick would seem like he'd have to go, right? Yeah, and Kyle Tucker has started eight straight games. Scott mentioned it, back-to-back -back days here against a lefty, hitting a homer off of Robbie Ray. I mean, to be, to be fair, Scott, you can probably hit a home run off Robbie Ray. Uh, where is Adam when you need him? Ooh. Gosh, uh, <laughs> Robbie you Ray. You guys have a lot more confidence in my athletic prowess <laughs> than you should. Uh, I don't know if it's faith in your athletic prowess or it's just trusting Robbie Ray to be <laughs> the worst pitcher of He's all time. Terrible. I yeah. would be terrified. To stand in the box against <laughs> Robbie Ray. Yeah, next thing you know, you get a fastball at the yeah. head. <laughs> that would not, I would not feel confident or comfortable with that at all. Chris, who's your oh my goodness gracious player uh, of the night? Free space on the board. Aaron Nola dominated the Yankees tonight. 12 strikeouts in, uh, was it six innings, seven innings? Six innings. Six innings, 12 strikeouts. Just absolutely dominant. Bounced back from... Uh, not great first start and, you know, obviously had a little extra time off between them, but the no rustiness, the velocity was back up. It was down in his first start, but he averaged 92.5 miles per hour with his fastball. Uh, had both the changeup and the knuckle curve working for him. 19 whiffs on 88 pitches. That's really good against this team. This is a really, really tough matchup and Aaron Nola completely dominated them. He was someone who, you know, towards the end of draft season, I noted a few times that it seemed like he was sliding in a couple drafts. I got him, I think, in the sixth or seventh round in one. And, uh, yeah, Aaron Nola's good, mm -hmm. guys. Yeah, yeah he, is, he is back to being an ace, I think, firmly with this. Only one walk between his two starts. Yep. And remember, long layoff in between the two, too. If anything, you'd be afraid he'd be – rusty coming into this start but was not he's really good yeah i hope you listen to scott because the other day i said oh you should probably wait until after the yankees start he's gonna get blown up uh, and then scott said <laughs> no nah, i mean you might want to trade for him now i mean if you need help if you lost mike soroka uh, maybe yeah. you lost 
Max Scherzer, we'll talk about that in a little bit as it, it well. Was like I was saying, if he dominated the Yankees, then exactly. there's no way you're going to be there's able no to way. get him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, whoever That's owns incredible. Aaron Nola right now is just <laughs> thanking their lucky stars that they have, A, yeah. a healthy starting pitcher, and someone who looks uh, pretty, pretty damn good. Chris, you mentioned the 19 swinging strikes on 88 pitches. Honestly, probably could have went another inning, but Joe Girardi has stated he's going to be quite cautious with his uh, pitching staff this season. At least six whiffs on each of the fastball, the curve, and the changeup. So he 100% had everything working for him. Uh, my The player I want to highlight here is actually Dallas Keuchel because he went up against the Milwaukee Brewers. Yes, they had no Christian Yelich in the lineup. It was a B lineup for sure. But seven innings pitched, one earned run, one walk, eight strikeouts. Wait for it. 17 swinging strikes for Dallas Keuchel. On 97 pitches, he had eight ground outs. Honestly, let's highlight both of the guys in this game. Adrian Hauser. This was like a Spider-Man meme game because both of these guys got induced a lot of ground balls. Uh, Hauser was great as well. Seven innings, just a little bit better than Keuchel. Uh, zero earned runs allowed. Five strikeouts, nine ground outs, 11 swinging strikes on 87 pitches. Scott, is there a chance that we weren't high enough on both Dallas Keuchel and Adrian Hauser? I know we liked Hauser as a sleeper, but so far both of these guys have looked really, really good this season. Yeah, I don't know what to make at the Keuchel start. I, I don't make much of it, frankly, because he had a combined three strikeouts uh, heading into this start before notching this big number. 17 swinging strikes. The last time he had that many in a start was 2017. Like This is just not his game, and it hadn't been his game up to this point in the season. And, you know, he's throwing softer than ever this year. So I, it's not like he suddenly f- discovered some stuff he didn't have before. I think that aspect of it is a total fluke. But, you know, he's, he's a reliable innings eater you know, when he's healthy, uh, he pitches deep into games. He's efficient. You know, he'll have some bad starts, some good starts, but the net result is decent enough that you're happy to, to, uh, I want to say happy to use him, but you, you're, he, he deserves to be rostered. He deserves to be started in the right matchups. And I think he came through for you this time. Hauser's the one that, uh, is really interesting because like he looked great as a starter down the stretch. The only real drawback was that he wasn't pitching that deep into games. Uh, he did have one start where he went seven innings like tonight, but a lot of them were, you know, he didn't even quite go five. But you looked at the number of pitches he was throwing. It was like 65, 70. Like they were clearly just taking it easy with him. You wondered how he'd fare once he started taking that third trip through the lineup. And so far, so good. I mean, he only went five innings in the first start, but one hit allowed. Obviously, seven shutout innings this time. He threw 87 pitches, so he was super efficient. The ground balls are there. I'm not sure how much of a strikeout pitcher he's going to be, but it'll be better than Keuchel. I think, you know, I, I think he could be Marcus Stroman-like, maybe even a little better. And uh, obviously, no reason you're going to drop him after this start. Yeah, I mean, definitely hold on to both guys, you know. Both pitchers you were drafting as you know bench guys, and I think they're more often than not going to creep their way into your lineup moving forward. Keiko's next star comes against the Detroit Tigers as well, so definitely doesn't hurt in a matchup like that, like what we saw out of Adrian Hauser today as well. I mentioned this a little bit before. Max Scherzer leaves his start after one inning with an apparent hamstring injury. It's not thought to be serious, and the hope is that he makes his... Next start, uh, Chris, did you see anything else regarding this? I mean, it seems kind of up in the air right now, but this is really the last thing we need after losing Soroka the other day. We've already lost Verlander this season. Uh, cross your fingers on Max Scherzer. Yeah, uh, I saw a note, I think it was from Eno Saris of The Athletic, that there have been five times as many non-COVID trips to the IL so far this season as there were. This was like three days ago as there were to the same point in the previous season. And that shouldn't be terribly surprising um, given the short ramp up, the fact the pitchers worked up and then back down. Uh, Apparently Scherzer felt this in his first start and pitched through it, felt it again this time, tried to pitch through it. This time you could see, you know, if you look at the velocity chart, he was throwing like 92 uh, at the end of the start or at the end of that inning, really. Um, Yeah. That's, not at all what you like to see, but the fact that they identified what it is and that it's not 
you know, an arm injury or especially a back injury like he suffered last year. Uh, I figure you kind of have to not be concerned, although you have to be a little bit concerned. <laughs> uh, Chris speaking in riddles. It's like inception here on the podcast. Um, Scott, any concern here? Any serious concern, Scherzer? Uh, well, it, it's, it's arguably your best player. So, you know, and you, you just wasted a start from him basically. Um, you only get so I, many. Yeah. I, I don't think he'll go on the IL. I expect him to make his next term. He's, he says he's not concerned. So, you know, I, I think it's probably no reason to panic here. I would say Edwin Encarnacion is considered day to day after being diagnosed with an SC joint inflammation in his left shoulder. Maybe that explains the slow start that he's off to. He's batting 200 with a 550 OPS and a 39% strikeout rate, or maybe He's just old, and Father Time is catching up to Edwin Encarnacion, but something to pay attention to. Other White Sox news, Nick Madrigal was placed on the IL with a separated shoulder. Scott, if you don't have enough IL spots, you could drop Nick Madrigal, right? Yeah, I mean, I'd want to hold on to him in, like, Roto Leagues with all the lineup spots with the need for speed. You could probably... He probably deserves to be on your IL in that format. Otherwise, you know, he he had to deliver to stay in those smaller lineups anyway. And yep. yeah, you could probably move on from him if you don't have a spot to stash him. Yeah, I mean, there's a non-zero chance he's gone for the rest of the season. Josh yeah, James. N- non-zero, though it does sound like they think he'll be back fairly soon. I'm trying to remember the exact timetable that was given if it was like two weeks I want to say it something. was end of August okay. was the phrasing I saw. Yeah. Although that's more than half the season. Yeah. I mean, that's like three weeks away from now. But hey, I mean, if he can chip in right. a handful of steals over the final month of the season, yeah. you know, that's something that can sway Roto Leagues, at yeah. least. A, a two to three week absence is a quarter of the season. So it's, yeah. it's not long, but it's long. It is. Josh James, we speculated, uh, might be headed back to the bullpen. That's exactly what is happening. Brandon Bialik a name that Chris has brought up multiple times here on the show, will make his first major league start on Thursday against the Arizona Diamondbacks. Bialik has bounced between the bullpen and the rotation in the minors last season, a 4-2-2 ERA, 1-2-2 whip between AA and AAA. Chris, your interest level in Bialik, it's really just deeper leagues for now, I'd imagine. Yeah, I mean, look, you probably need pitching. I would rather have like Pablo Lopez from last night or even Tyler Malley. But oh, yeah. Bialik's interesting. Yeah, I'm definitely going to keep an eye on him. And, uh, you know, four-pitch pitcher, doesn't throw super hard, but he's not a soft tosser either. Apparently, the curveball is really good. So, you know, I want to see what he can do. I'll take his teammate over him as well, Framber Valdez. Remember, he pitched in relief the other day. looked really good. Sure, yeah. So let's see what happens mm-hmm. there with uh, Framber Valdez. Ozzy Albies was placed on the IL. Scott, the hitch just keep coming for your Atlanta Braves with a bone contusion on his right wrist. Some of the top replacements, the most added second baseman on CBS Sports, David Fletcher, Hanser Alberto, Shed Long, and Jonathan Scope. Scott, which one of those four second basemen, if you lost Ozzy Albies, are you trying to pick up right now? Fletcher, Alberto, Long, and Scope. Well, Fletcher. If he's going to bat leadoff for the Angels, despite the fact that he's not going to provide much in the way of power or speed, he's going to hit for average. He's probably going to score a lot of runs. Uh, in a points league, the fact he doesn't strike out should make him usable. There may be somebody in shallower leagues better than him, but like he, he's to the point now where I think he's he's getting pretty close to to being hey, must have. David Fletcher homered today. There you That's go. Two. And, and you know, kind of a, a low key. Uh, Actually, back point, to back with Trout. Point about Fletcher yeah. is. He's quadruple eligible, and that's yeah. you know that's always useful. But I think particularly this season, when you run the risk of at any getting moment a team shutting it down for a week, and like if it's right at a lineup lock and you're you're past the point where you can pick up a player, having a guy who's quadruple eligible, uh, that that seems like a pretty big deal. Now it's a great point that you bring up. He's sixty six percent rostered on CBSSports.com, so might be floating around there in some twelve team leagues. Definitely in some ten teamers. Second, third base, uh, outfield, and shortstop eligibility, especially with this season with so many postponements and players getting hurt. Um, 
He's a great player to have on your roster right now. Rafael Montero is on track to be activated off the IL this weekend for the Rangers. Chris, any chance he enters the mix here for saves with the Texas Rangers? It's possible. I mean, I when was the last time Rafael Montero pitched in the majors? He pitched last year and he was pretty good. Yeah, okay. he was pretty good. He was he was somebody I was in, in deeper leagues handcuffing to LeClerc because I just I assumed he'd that, be next yeah. in line. Last season, a two four eight ERA, yeah, zero point nine seven yeah. whip, almost eleven Ks per nine, under two walks per nine. He he was good. It was only it was only twenty two appearances, yeah, but right. it was twenty nine innings. Like they they haven't had to they haven't had a save chance I think since since that initial one where Nick Goody you know where Leclerc got hurt warming up and they hurriedly warmed up Goody and he got the save and then they said ah it's just a matchups thing whatever. Uh, Jonathan Hernandez looks like their high leverage guy, but they've stuck to pitching him in the eighth inning, often for multiple innings. He keeps piling up strikeouts. Uh, like it to me, it if to me it seemed inevitable he was going to wind up in that role just because it's like who else would? I don't think Nick Good- Goody really uh, stood a great chance of doing that. But if they get Rafael Montero back, that that. And he picks up where he left off. That gives them, uh, you know, an, an easy way to keep Hernandez where they want him. So hopefully, hopefully Montero becomes a solution there. Right now, the top guy to own in the Rangers bullpen, I, I think, is still Hernandez. But we'll see how it plays out. Speaking of up, Scott, way to pick me up. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of bullpens, Quang Hyun Kim is headed back to the rotation. So now we're Weird. back left. Trying to figure out what is going on with the St. Louis Cardinals. You guys were huge fans of Giovanni Gallegos heading into the season. Uh, Helsley has seemingly pitched well for them. And they actually called up Alex Reyes as well. Hmm. Chris, if you're handicapping this situation right now. I think I would have to go with Gallegos. You know, he seemed like he should have been the guy until, you know, he wasn't able to report to the team. Um Helsley, I just, I think he's just a guy. I just, I'm not, I just don't think he's all that good. And so I would rather bet on the upside with Gallegos that he gets the chance. Although, yeah, if Alex Reyes looks like Alex Reyes, you know, it might be him. He hasn't looked like Alex Reyes basically since that one start he made mm-hmm. before I think he tore his pec or injured his shoulder after coming back from Tommy John surgery. But I, I mean, let's. I, I like, think it was the uh, the lat injury. Yeah, he was yeah. like a Vladimir Guerrero, Ronald Acuna esque pitching prospect. Like he was considered yeah. to be that kind of dominant pitching prospect, and so you know maybe there can be a a spike out of the bullpen from him. His velocity was way down. Yeah. Uh, at in in spring and summer camp or I guess summer camp I don't know if he pitched in the spring, um, but you know the fact that they called him up maybe he's maybe it's back I don't know I, like it, I'll watch it for sure if he if he makes a couple of good outings and he's throwing ninety six ninety seven you know that'll be something to to keep an eye on I think there's a good chance he enters into a committee for however long they stick to a committee but I think just given his health history his ability to bounce back from outing to outing may not be what's yeah. required of a closer. That's what I'd worry about as far as his prospects go. And Gallegos, I mean, I hope it's Gallegos. He's he's clearly the most deserving, but to the extent this matters and people on the Cardinals beat seems to think it seem to think it matters when Mike Schilt was listing off options for the ninth inning with Kim going to the rotation, the first name he mentioned was Ryan Helsley. That that came up in, in summer camp too, and then they ended up naming Kim the closer. But for what it's worth, uh, I'm suspecting Helsley gets the first chance in the role. I hope not. I hope it's Gallegos. Helsley, 28% rostered on CBS Sports. Giovanni Gallegos is 56%. Um, hmm. All right, so let's throw all these Cardinals in together. Rafael Montero. I feel like we do this every night with just like a who's who of closer candidates. And then... Last night, Scott, I don't know if you have it in you, if you've got the Michael Kane ready, but Ty Buttry, your boy, picked up a save last night. So let me put all five of those names in a in a pot. And which yeah. one are you pulling out first here, Scott? Is it Gallegos? Is it Helsley? Montero? 
Is it it's, Alex it's a Reyes? new segment. We're calling it Closer Gumbo. <laughs> Closer Gumbo. All in a who's pot. The, who's the Andouille? Who are you pulling out first? And, and Buttery, ya boy. Buttery. You might use some butter to make a roux <laughs> when you make a gumbo. <laughs> I like that you're furthering this analogy. That's, <laughs> that's good. That's nice. Um, I think Buttery stinks. All right. I'd like him to be awesome right. <laughs> so that we could always refer back to the Michael Caine impression. But bottom line is he he's, has not been very good. And I, uh, one of the Angels beat writers uh, seemed to suggest that the idea is to pull back on Hansel Robles until, you know, he gets right, which may never happen if, if he's permanently lost that velocity. But like, I, I don't think Buttrey's the answer. I don't know who is the answer if it's not him, but. Like that's not appetizing at all. So I don't know who who else was in this gumbo. <laughs> the Cardinals guys and Rafael Montero. I mean, I would go like number one and two on that list for me would be Helsley and Gallegos. Okay. Um, last closer note, Aroldis Chapman won't be activated, quote, anytime soon. He's been cleared apparently and he's throwing, but won't be activated. Uh, Zach Britton picked up his fifth save of the season tonight against the Philadelphia Phillies. Some lineup stuff from today. Christian Yelich was out of the lineup today. Mentioned that earlier. Uh, definitely helped Dallas Keuchel pitch well in that game. I just want to ask, guys, if there is anything that you see, hear, read going on with Christian Yelich, I understand these things can change on the drop of a dime. He can have a four-hit game, and next thing you know, the batting average is where we expect it to be. But his approach thus far has been quite weird. 60% ground ball rate. He's striking at 43% of the time. His swinging strike rate is, his swing rate, excuse me, is a career low. So he's just not being aggressive swinging at pitches. And then when he does, he's swinging and missing. He, Any concern over Yelich? Just got to ask. They are, opposing pitchers are just not pitching to him, really. Um, I think he's seen like 19% of, of Let's see, 46% of the pitches that, that have been thrown to him have been fastballs, and only 23% have been four-seam fastballs. So pitchers are really trying to feed him a healthy dose of breaking stuff. And I, I want to say, I'm trying to look for it right now, but I think there was a, like, Christian Yelich, I'm not quite up to speed quote from, like, right before the season started. Um he might yeah. just be a little out of whack, but you're not going to do anything about it. No, like you're you're not going to. What are you going to do? Trade Christian Yelich eight games into the season? No, like you can't. He's rusty. He he's he's. It's timing is wrong. He's not caught up to velocity yet. Like they they got so few chances leading up to the season that you have to expect. Yeah, yeah you have to have a little uh, a little patience, a little more <laughs> even than usual. I know that sounds weird in a short season, but like he's going to come around. I, I really have no doubt about it. We're already seeing Ronald Acuna who got off to, I think an even worse start with all the strikeouts. Yeah. Uh, we're already seeing him come around. He's going to be know, fine. Pitching. Uh, I want to, I'm trying to look for this story as well, but I think I've seen a couple of references to like pitching being ahead of hitting right now. Mm. Uh, generally speaking, it seems like pitchers are doing better than they typically do, even with uh, all of them getting hurt. <laughs> and so, you know, that may just be the case. Maybe it's just that that, that brief uh, summer camp window really held the, the hitters back as a whole. Unless your name is Robbie Ray, of course, Chris. Uh, we did get an email from Jonah earlier today, and we've received a few emails regarding Christian Yelich. And he said he's in a 12-team head-to-head points league, and I've been in talks with an owner about Yelich. He offered me Christian Yelich for my Chris Bryant and Dylan Bundy. Boom. Am I hesitating take too it. much for Yelich, or am I giving up too much? You take that? Yeah, take it. In a heartbeat. All day, in a heartbeat, before he has a chance to retract the offer. You hit accept. Yeah, I like you I like profit. Dylan Bundy quite a bit, but I don't think that's going to deter me from trying to acquire <laughs> Christian yeah. Yelich right now on the cheap. I will just say, we did a worryometer on Yelich. I think it was last week, Scott. And I mentioned that I just don't think the Brewers lineup is nearly as good as it has been in years past. They lost Moustakas. They lost Grandal. So there's just a chance that teams are not going to pitch to Yelich 
And, you know, maybe this is just an extended slump in a shortened season, which, you know, will uh, will reflect very poorly when we look back on it. But <laughs> I will just, I'll just throw it out there. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I don't. Ryan Healy's batting leadoff for them. I, I, it's a uh, bad lineup. Against lefties. And Eric Sogard Jed, is playing. And Jed Jerko hit cleanup. Behind I remember number three hitter Avi Sale Garcia today. So it's not a great lineup right now. No, I'm not sure. It, a lot of things have gone wrong for the Brewers so far. I, I remember the freak out when the Braves started rebuilding about Freddie Freeman and what, yeah. like, nobody's going to pitch to him. I'm trying to remember exactly what year that was, but I think it was the year that. I think it was the year he broke out. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was that 20. And he walked a lot. 20, yeah. He did walk a lot, but like it. Great hit, great hitters. That, that doesn't really like, that doesn't really affect them. Like you'll occasionally see, like, I think we saw that a little bit with Bryce Harper when Ryan Zimmerman started to slip. Uh, but for the most part, like guys are good because they're good. Not because there's someone good behind them. Uh, somebody who is not good right now, or I mean, he's not even getting the opp- opportunity to prove that he's good, is Chris Davis with a K, who homered on Monday. He started against a left-handed pitcher. He homered against a righty, actually, has not played each of the past two games, has now sat out three of the last four games, and it seems like he is on the weak side of a platoon. Like, he is only starting against left-handed pitching. So I, I feel like I asked a question every single night, Scott, are we getting closer to dropping Chris Davis now that it looks like he's platooning? Um, look, I don't think you have any reason to roster Chris Davis in a league where you're only starting nine hitters. So this the standard head-to-head lineup, and and he's occupying your one flexible spot like that. That just doesn't add up for me. But if you're talking about a league where you're starting fourteen hitters, like the standard roto league. Not saying you have to start him, but he's probably worth keeping around for the upside. Uh, yeah, obviously, a, a couple weeks of this, probably not, but but I'd, I'd give him a little more time. Mookie Betts was still out today. Michael Brantley is sitting a second straight game with a quad issue. Uh, he is expected to, hopefully, be back in the lineup on Friday. All right, let's take a look at the action from Wednesday night and start off with some random pitching performances. And I want to ask you, which one of these fellas interests you most? Alex Cobb. Yeah, that Alex Cobb against the Miami Marlins. Five innings pitched, one earned run, seven strikeouts, 14 swinging strikes on 86 pitches. His splitter usage is up. He has a two-start week next week against the Phillies and the Washington Nationals. Rick Porcello was going up against the Nationals in Washington tonight, entering this game with a 13.50 ERA, seven innings pitched, one earned run, only four strikeouts. Martin Perez against the Rays, five innings pitched, uh, five shutout innings with four strikeouts. Randy Dobnak at the Pirates, six shutout innings, one strikeout, a ton of ground balls, 11 ground ball outs for Randy Dobnak. Uh, Trevor Williams, the other side in that game, seven innings pitched, one earned run, and Chris Bubich, Bubich, six innings, two runs, two walks, six strikeouts, 13 swinging strikes on 88 pitches. Chris, I'll go to you here first. Which one of these fellas interests you most? Cobb, Porcello, Martin Perez, Randy Dobnak, Trevor Williams, and Bubich? Uh, I think it's got to be the young prospect guy. So Chris Bubich, who you'll see, you know, as you noted, he did throw... 97 miles an hour. Uh, that was, I don't know what was happening in the first inning of that start. He must have had a lot of uh, adrenaline pumping because his velocity spiked at 97 miles an hour and basically immediately dropped to like 91, 92. And that's where you should expect him to mostly be. But, you know, there's a little deception in there. He's got a couple of good pitches. And I think what we've seen from him so far, I, I think that and the fact that he's young, and making that leap from, you know, never pitching even in double A, I think I want to see more of him. And and after that, I, w- I would probably go Gibson and Cobb. Did weirdly you say enough. Gibson? Was Gibson uh, in that group? He should have been. He should have been. Kyle Gibson against oh, the A's yeah. had nine strikeouts, a quality start, three earned runs over six innings pitched. Uh, he has a two-star week next week. He's going up against the Mariners and the Rockies in Colorado. 
Yeah, I th- Gibson and, and Bubich are kind of 1A, 1B. Maybe you're not going to want to start Gibson, but, you know, he's always been one of those guys that, like, fantasy baseball nerds, and I count myself among their ranks, uh, have always been really interesting. He's got this really good slider, and he occasionally throws it a lot, and he does really well. Uh, and he was pretty good last year, and the Rangers are kind of making a habit out of turning your – leftover veteran pitchers into you know pretty good pretty good uh fantasy contributors and he threw his slider 40 times on 103 pitches today mm-hmm. you know it it's i i think if i need someone that i feel comfortable starting i'd probably go with gibson i if i'm speculating it's probably bubich but i'm not sure how i would compare them to like pablo lopez from yesterday you're, so you're really down I, with Pablo Lopez. I mean, Elias Hernandez. He wasn't as good. Very similar today. He wasn't as good. And Elias Hernandez, uh, I would argue, belongs in this group. I would be more interested in Elias Hernandez than Rick Porcello or Mart- Martin Perez. Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, that's fair. That's actually fair. <laughs> even like Randy Dobnak. I know he's had a couple of good starts so far, but like. There are zero strikeouts there. I, well, I mean, I, technically, there was one. I was going to say, today. come on, Chris. I mean, give the guy credit. Well, he had a strikeout. Relatively I, I, speaking. <laughs> I actually want to talk about Dobnak of that group because, uh, like, I, I I think you hit number one and two perfectly. Bubich and, and uh, Gibson, who, you know, I, I think of Gibson as kind of a poor man's Dylan Bundy and that he al- has always had this one great secondary pitch that has made his whiff rate much higher than you'd suspect for a pitcher who performs like him otherwise. And maybe this change of scenery will allow him to put it all together. Thinking through my rosters, I'm not sure how many I could honestly make room for Kyle Gibson on, but you know, he, he's interesting. This, this definitely uh, gives me something to watch out for moving forward. Dobnak, I think though, is like, he might actually be, kind of under the radar good we usually associate with strikeouts goodness with strikeouts among pitchers as we should it's the most important thing a pitcher can do but Dobnek does like the second and third most important things really really well elite ground ball rate throws a ton of strikes doesn't hurt himself with walks Uh, six innings three hits no runs in this start He's allowed a combined one earned run Dobnak has across three starts. His ERA in, uh, I believe it was, uh, how many appearances was it in the majors last year? Right around 10, I think. His ERA in those, it was nine? Yeah. Was 159. His ERA in the minors last year was 207. His whip was .98. Strikeouts were low everywhere. That's just not what he does. But, like, he could be this... Dallas Keuchel type pitcher that ends up being someone well worth streaming, especially with that lineup backing him and a good bullpen to help him preserve wins. Like, so here's the he could be usable. How many Dallas Keuchel types are there in baseball? There's not a ton, but not they're many. not. There's not. No, I'm not talking about results. I'm not talking about like how good Dallas Keuchel is. I'm just talking about like the kind of profile we're talking about. Yeah, because there's really only one Dallas Keuchel. Like, this is not a profile in today's major league environment that really plays well uh, for more than, like, a handful of starts here or there. You know, that's – and Dallas Keuchel is, you know, a pretty extreme pitcher in a lot of ways. Like, there's no starting pitcher who throws the ball out of the strike zone more than Dallas Keuchel. I, mean, I don't he, think he's, he's exactly a Dallas Keuchel, to be fair, because Dallas – like, I think Dobnak's a better control pitcher than Keuchel. He might actually be a little worse at missing bats, but um, yeah, I, I it, don't it's know. just I, kind of the rare pitcher who comes along who ends up being serviceable, even though he doesn't miss bats. I think Dobnik, yeah, does Dobnak. I'm sorry, does everything a pitcher who doesn't get strikeouts possibly could to put himself in a position to be usable. He would definitely be below. I think he would be below Tyler Malley for me. I think that's fair. Malley was very impressive last night, and the swinging strikes were up for him. And you know, it wasn't uh, an easy matchup by any means. I, you know, I, I would say that the Cleveland Indians are probably like a middle of the road matchup right now. 
Uh, and Mally looked very good against him. So I, I would put him a, ahead of Dobnak. But for me, I, I think Bubich and Dobnak are, are the 1A and 1B for me, especially considering that Dobnak does have two starts where he's lined up for two starts. I mean, you can't really assume scheduling right now. Yeah. But uh, he's at Milwaukee. We just, you know, ripped that lineup to shreds. And he's going up against the Royals. That's a very good two-star week. So yeah, I'm, just, pretty, I'm pretty interested in Dobnak. I really struggle with a guy who can't get strikeouts and already throws his breaking pitches like 50% of the time. He also it's has... Like, man, there is nowhere to go. He has an amazing mustache, Chris. He No, I, look, aesthetically, I am a Randy Dobnak fan. <laughs> I right, Chris, would love to see him win the American League Cy Young. Uh, am- I'm just... Uh, there are pitchers I have more faith in for my fantasy team. I, I do want to ask you guys about Mally because Chris Welsh and I were both pretty dismissive of him yesterday as a guy who has a really good fastball, has always had a really good fastball, throws it a ton, gets creamed the third time through the lineup. So he rarely has starts where he, you know, even goes six innings like he did yesterday. Occasionally he'll have a good start like that, but, um, you know, there, there's a pretty clear pattern there, and I'm not. So, you're wondering why we like him. Yes, <laughs> I cannot speak for Frank, but I have always been a Tyler Malley guy. He was someone who uh, rated out really well by the Aces metric um, in terms of stuff and command. And, you know, his velocity's up 94 miles per hour through two starts with his fastball. And he is someone who has tinkered a lot with his pitch mix over the years. Came in uh, with a low 80 slider and a fastball that he averaged right around 93, a change of 84. He's tinkered a lot because he doesn't have anything but a fastball. He's tinkered a lot, but (laughs) you know, now he's got this 86 mile an hour fastball that has been, or sorry, 86 mile an hour slider that is a new new version of the pitch somewhere between the cutter that he tinkered with last year and the slider he used to have, that's been a really good pitch for him in the early going. Uh, He's got this changeup that he's throwing a little harder. That's been a really good pitch for him. So I just, I think the arm talent is there, and I'm hopeful that he has stumbled upon the right mix because he was, uh, you know, a decent prospect, pretty good minor league numbers, has always had, uh, you know, pretty good control. And so I'm just, admittedly, he's just, I wrote this in the waiver wire column yesterday. He's one of my guys. And so is Pablo Lopez. And they're two guys that I just have always been really interested in. Pablo Mm -hmm. Lopez change up yesterday. Looked out of this world good. You know Uh, who I got? I got serious Luis Castillo vibes from Pablo Lopez last night with that change up. (laughs) I mean, Luis Castillo's change up is like, looked. I'm kind of with you on Pablo Lopez. I stuck up for Lopez on yesterday's show. Uh, when Welsh wasn't really willing to go there, but uh, you know, with in, in his case, there's great control and and like he tends to pitch really deep in the game. So even if the strikeouts aren't there, I think remember uh and plus he's remember, a stallion, of course. Of course. <laughs> I'm trying to think of that guy. I think his name was also Lopez, but I can't remember Rodrigo Lopez. Remember him? Like maybe you don't. <laughs> um, I've but he was like no this clue. not very good pitcher who. <laughs> nonetheless was usable quite frequently and i think like that's the downside for lopez so he'll always be kind of in that mix as a streamer option but you know maybe there's a potential with that change up that he develops into more i certainly like a pitcher with a really good secondary pitch for me for mally i'll just put a put a bow on this conversation i have to study it more but just watching him pitch yesterday it looked different like his mechanics look different so i have to go back and watch from last year but it, it, it reminded me of like he was holding his hands closer to his body. It looked a little bit like Lucas Giolito, the way that like that transformation that Giolito went through and the velocity being up. I mean, those two things in conjunction, um, you know, might actually lead to to something here for Tyler Malley. It's worth noting, you know, a 53% fly ball rate in Great American Ballpark is not going to cut it. So he's got to get that down. But uh, the velocity coupled with you know, the potential changes in mechanics. I'm going to read more about that and update you guys on it. But um, it, he looked like a different pitcher to me yesterday. So, interested Rod- in Mally, interested Rodrigo in Lopez. Lopez was good in <laughs> 2002 and 2004. I was thinking it was more like five years ago. 
That's how you know you're getting old. Did lead the majors in losses one year. (laughs) Hey, you know what? Got to pitch deep into games to be able to do that. That is correct. And I will just remind everyone that Spencer Turnbull had 17 losses last year. And he looks like a different man. So (laughs) don't hold the losses against the pitcher. It's not necessarily his fault. Speaking of which, losses. Guys that are not pitching well right now. Can you drop these pitchers? J-Hap. Yes. I'm just going to go out and see. Like, he should not be 79% rostered anymore. Six walks today. Someone mm. that I was mildly excited about heading into the season. Mm. You can drop him for, I would yep. say, anyone we just talked about. Mally, Lopez, Bubich. I'll drop him for Randy Dobnak if I need yeah. a two-star pitcher. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, 100% agree. By the way, Mookie Betts is in the game as a defensive replacement. So, okay. Just, he's seems fine. Worth monitoring for sure. Uh, some other names on this list. Sean Manaya, another clunker. Three and a third. Six hits. Four earned runs. Five strikeouts. He is rostered in 95% of CBS leagues. And per Martin Gallegos, who covers the A's for MLB.com, I saw this on Twitter earlier, Sean Manaya has a 22.5 ERA in the fourth and fifth inning through three starts this season. So he's not even making it third time through the order. Order. It's second time through the order that Sean Manaya is absolutely getting crushed. Same thing with Lance McCullers today at the Diamondbacks, an offense that had been struggling. I think they were like 25th in runs scored entering tonight's game. Seven hits, eight earned runs. Uh, it was really that second time through the lineup. They absolutely crushed him. People were speculating on Twitter that he was tipping his pitches there. Uh, he is also 96% rostered. And then Robbie Ray. You know, we brought up the name, but I mean, what are you going to do with this guy at this point? He allowed six earned runs again today including three homers. I get It's a tough matchup against Houston. Scott, Manaya, McCullers, Robbie Ray. We already said you could drop Hap. Are you dropping all three of these guys? Or are you dropping none of these guys? If you had to drop I, one, which one would it be? I think I've dropped Manaya everywhere I had him. If not, I'd be comfortable doing that. I'd drop him for Bubich. I'm not sure I'd drop him for all of those kind of scrubby pitchers we talked about, but, you know, there, there's a chance somebody... There's somebody out there in your league that he's worth dropping for. Uh, the colors and Robbie Ray, I think the upside is so good that I, I'd still hold on to them. Obviously, would not feel comfortable starting them right now. McCullers working his way back from Tommy John surgery. That's always difficult. The velocity is down like a mile per hour. The weirdest thing about McCullers is like he, we're used to seeing him throw his curveball 50% of the time. Yeah. It's kind of the key to his success, and he's throwing it more like 30% of the time now, which is still a lot, but considerably less than 50%. He's so mostly I'd, traded those out for change-ups, though. It's not like he's throwing the fastball more. Yeah, well, it, and, it's not working for him. <laughs> yeah, and you know he's got one of those change-ups that you know, it does have a lot of horizontal movement. and can. I mean, he's always been a guy who struggles with his control. Uh, mm-hmm. McCullers. Yeah. You, I'm not dropping McCullers or Robbie Ray, although Robbie Ray looks like he's kind of in that Travis Shaw territory where if you remember last year, Travis Shaw yeah, just got off to such a horrible start and just never fixed it. And it was because he Cause, tinkered with his swing before the season yeah. got to spring training, wasn't comfortable with it and tried to get back to it. And that's like, every time we talk about like swing changes or new pitching mechanics, we always tend to view it as, well, this can only help. And it's like, Maybe it can, but it can also make things worse, especially if, you know, maybe Robbie Ray is trying to like, maybe he's fighting between the two of them. It may look, maybe it clicks and he ends up being really good. We know the potential is there, uh, but right now you definitely can't start him. And I'm not, I'm not going out to, to make trades for uh, either of these Robbie guys. Ray. Well, yeah, either of them, but especially Robbie Ray. As for, Manaya, you know, you mentioned that stat fourth and fifth times through the order. Not even you fourth can, and fifth time through, just fourth well, yeah, and fifth sorry, innings. Fourth yeah. and fifth innings. Yep. You can see that in his pitch velocity chart. Uh, his like 22nd or 23rd fastball was 91 miles an hour. And all the ones after that up to 40 were below 90. He just has not been able to sustain his velocity into starts. It was a pretty stark drop off in this one. And you're going to get less effective. Like he's not a guy who has a lot of velocity to lose anyway. He peaks at like 93, 94 um, and probably more like 93. So that, that is a concerning sign for Shaman. I I'd be fine dropping him in anything shallower than like 14 teams. Yeah. I think we're all kind of in agreement here. You're all right. Dropping hat. We're all right. Dropping Manaya. Hold on to Robbie Ray. Although 
I'm a little bit closer towards letting go of Robbie Ray. It's just, it's really hard in a shortened season to hope that he turns it around. Yeah. Uh, McCullers is definitely the one out of the group that I want to hold on to most. And, you know, if you can get him for dirt cheap right now, it's, it's something that I would look into doing on Lance McCullers. Quickly promote, promote a few things. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash fantasy baseball today. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed thus far. And a reminder that to celebrate fantasy football draft season, our friends over at the Fantasy Football Today podcast, Adam Azer, Jamie, Dave Richard, all those gentlemen over there, they're giving away a 75-inch and a 55-inch TV. The contest is completely free to enter. To win, go to cbssports.com slash giveaway. All right, when we come back, we've got a lot more to get to on Wednesday's slate of action. We'll do that here on Fantasy Baseball Today. We're firing up the worryometer, not on a Wednesday. Well, technically, we're recording this Wednesday night, so I guess it works, but you're going to be listening to this on a Thursday. Mike Clevenger against the Cincinnati Reds, five and two-thirds innings pitched, two hits, zero earned runs, five walks, four strikeouts. Back-to-back games with five walks for Mike Clevenger. Scott, where does he rank on the worryometer? Mike Clevenger, that is. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not nothing. But I don't want to overstate it either. I'll I'll go three. Uh, the last two starts with a lot of walks. That's concerning. You know, he's his velocity is also closer to where it was two years ago than last year. That's okay, I think. Two years ago, he was still a very good pitcher. Um, when I saw him pitch in summer camp, he looked pretty wild then too. So I was kind of surprised he walked nobody in his first start. I'm not exactly sure where the walks are coming from. I'm a, I'm presuming it's just he's not in midseason form yet. But I think there's enough there to uh, to remain enthusiastic about that. Like this isn't a Madison Bumgarner situation. This isn't a case of him losing a lot of stuff. I I think he's going to be fine. So I'll go three. I may have an explanation for the walks at least in this start. Uh, he was throwing a cutter today. And if you look at Baseball Savannah, they'll say he threw 40 sliders or 42 sliders, but about half of them or close to it were thrown about 90 miles per hour. So it's pretty clear his sliders usually in the low 80s. So it's pretty clear it was a distinct pitch that uh, baseball or stack has just hasn't been able to account for properly. That seems like the kind of thing that could throw your control off. Where are you on the worryometer, Chris, with Clevenger? I know that you were just in general kind of worried about him coming into the season. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, he threw eleven of those, uh, like eighteen or so cutters for as balls. So, you know that that could explain some of it. Yeah, I'm. I think if you thought Mike Clevenger was going to be one of the five best pitchers in baseball, you you should be like an eight or a nine on the worryometer. Yeah. I didn't think he would be. Right. Yeah, he's so, not going to win Cy. I feel confident saying Mike Clevenger is not going to be the AL Cy Young winner this well, year. You, yeah, Shane Bieber is. So, <laughs> well, um, even without that, yeah. So yeah, like he he had gotten hit really hard the first two starts, but that's never been a Mike Clevenger thing. He's one of the best at re, uh, limiting hard contact. So it just seems like a kind of weird start, and you know he, he's had a lot of injuries and he's working on some stuff and. I think he'll be fine. Like, I, I think he's going to settle in as like the f- 13th to 15th best pitcher in baseball, and you're not going to have to think about it. Yeah, and it's not completely uncommon for him to have these games with a lot of walks. I looked into his career game log, and 17 of his 87 career starts, he has walked four or more batters. So it, it's not completely uncommon for him to be wild at times. Yeah. Um, so, look, if someone in your league is... walk rate in 2015, or 2016, 2017, jeez. If someone in your league is freaking out about Clevenger, then, uh, you know, we got a question on, on Twitter today, you know, asking about the walk rate. So if someone else is uh, concerned about it, I would be trying to uh, acquire him right now if you can. Uh, someone else that I hope you listen to Scott about. We were going through some buy low candidates the other day. If you lost out on Mike Soroka, he mentioned Arenola. He also mentioned Hyunjin Ryu, who went into Atlanta today. Five innings pitched, one hit three walks, eight strikeouts, 21 swinging strikes on 84 pitches. That's insane right there. 25%. Yeah. And and on 38 changeups. 14 (laughs) on those changeups. Yeah. So he went heavy with the changeup and the cutter tonight. 
Um, yeah. He looked great tonight, Scott, but the three walks, it, I feel like that's kind of a weird thing for Ryu. Yeah, definitely out of character. And he did that in his first start of the season too. Uh, you know, he had a few starts last year where he had three walks. So I don't make that much of it. Uh, you know, he's not going to have many games where he gets this many swinging strikes either. Probably worth pointing out. Freddie Freeman was out of the lineup. Of course, Ozzy Albies was out of the lineup. So it wasn't the Braves A team out there, but there was no reason to really be worried about Hyunjin Ryu. And hopefully he's ended, removed whatever concerns you had with this start. Some hitter notes from Wednesday. Some fun with youngins. Dom Smith was batting cleanup against scheduled starter Max Scherzer on Wednesday. He wound up hitting an RBI double off lefty Sean Doolittle. Uh, Dom Smith was not in the lineup. I believe it was last night or two nights ago against a left-handed pitcher. So maybe the fact that he hit that RBI double tonight off Sean Doolittle will help him get in the lineup uh, more frequently. Scott, do you think he needs to be owned in 12-team head-to-head points leagues yet or not that shallow? I missed the name. Who Dom, are we talking about? Dom Smith. Not that shallow yet, no. Um, especially since we saw him sit against the one lefty. Uh you know, since Cespedes has left. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm definitely interested in him, but it's more of a scout team situation. I probably want to pick him up in anything shallower than 15 team leagues right now. I was going to say he's not that young. And then I remembered he's six months younger than Pete Alonso. So. <laughs> it's just completely absurd. Uh, Kyle Tucker, someone we mentioned earlier in the show, he started eight straight games, hit a home run off Robbie Ray tonight and had two hits yesterday against the lefty uh, Madison Bumgarner. Alex Verdugo hit his first home run of the season. First home run as a Red Sox. Two-run homer off another lefty. Ryan Yarbrough here. So lefty on lefty action for some youngsters here. And entering tonight's game, he had an 81% ground ball rate. So I know that that was something I wanted to pay attention to heading into the season. Kind of similar to uh, Vladimir Guerrero, where you know you want to see Verdugo lift the ball and hit more line drives. Um, Chris, I mean, what have you made so far of Alex Verdugo? I mean, he's been playing more consistently than he was, you know, when the season first started, but 81% ground ball rate. Don't love that. No, that's, that's not the, the approach that you want to see from uh, Alex Verdugo, although it's not surprising. He's always going to be a, a ground ball heavy kind of guy. Um, And it won't be 81% either, (laughs) you know, moving forward, it will probably be something like 50%. I think that's about where he was last season. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay with what he's done so far. I would hope there's more power to come. Uh, but, you know, even if he had played a full season this year, I thought the ceiling was probably closer to 20 or 25. Um, so, you know, hopefully we got better things coming and, you know, it'll take more balls in the air to get there. Yeah, and the Red Sox need help with their lineup any way they can get it. So, you know, if he gets hot, hopefully... Um, they can move him up the lineup. That would be great for Verdugo's value. Gary Sanchez, Scott, someone that we're receiving a lot of questions about right now. And look, rightfully so. He is two for his first 27 to start the season. He is another one of those extremely streaky players. 16 strikeouts in those 27 at-bats. He only has one extra base hit, which is a double. Scott, if someone offers you their Gary Sanchez for your Christian Vasquez right now, are you accepting that trade? I am. How about accepting that trade? How about if it's for your Wilson Contreras? Um, it's a little closer. That's one of those situations where I think it's close enough that I'd rather do no harm, and I'd probably just stick with, you know, if I was in the opposite situation, I'd probably stick with Kerry Sanchez. Like, yeah, I, I have a hard time with making a trade that I feel is more or less equal. You know what's funny though? Uh, even with how bad he's been and how much he's struggling, he still has an average exit velocity of 93.1 miles per hour, 45.5% hard hit rate. Now, obviously, that is uh, you know, only counting balls that you put in play, which has been half or fewer of his plate appearances so far, <laughs> which is bad. It um, is, but I don't know, like a lot of the reasons why we typically get concerned about Gary Sanchez, like he's hitting too many fly balls or he's hitting too many pop-ups. Those haven't actually been the issue. So I, I think it's probably just a, a, a tough streak and he'll be fine. 
Josh Bell, another one who is off to a slow start. He had three hits tonight, including two extra base hits, a double, and a home run. Some bullpen notes. Brandon Kinsler picked up the save in the first game of the doubleheader uh, for his second save of the season. They had another save opportunity in the second game of the doubleheader, of their doubleheader, and it went to uh, Stephen Tarpley. So, I mean, I don't think he's a name that's really worth monitoring or anything. I just think it was Brandon Kinsler was used in the first game. (laughs) By the way, how crazy is it that here we are two weeks into the season, among the most secure closers are Brandon Kinsler, Mark Melanson, and Joe Jimenez. (laughs) In fairness, Brandon Kinsler has only had two opportunities and only really five games. Are you really worried about him? I mean, he's he's always been so stable. But there were guys who we weren't worried about coming into the season who have already lost their jobs and, you know, playing half as many or fewer games as everyone else. So he just hasn't had a chance to lose. I mean, look, I'm not saying he will (laughs) blow it. I'm just saying he has not yet had the chance to. It's definitely fair, uh, but I will point out <laughs> there is not a lot here in this bullpen. I mean, Brad Boxberger, it's not no, great. No, I mean, it, Nick Vincent. It wasn't a great bullpen before two thirds of the team got <laughs> COVID 19. So, yeah. Well, you wouldn't know based on the way that they're playing and uh, crushing oh. everybody. Helps when you play the Baltimore Orioles, of course, Chris. But first place, baby. Let's go. Let's go, Marlon. Seth Lugo, two clean innings for the save. On Wednesday, Edwin Diaz pitched uh, last night in a loss. Well, I guess two nights ago now, Whenever when you're listening to this. And Yuri's Familia had pitched uh, the previous two days before today as well. So, I mean, Scott, I don't yeah. know if there's any serious takeaway here. It just seems like a fluid situation. Uh, and yeah. Lugo was I, the uh, freshest one here tonight. Uh, yeah, I, I still think Diaz is the guy you want from the Mets bullpen. His last two appearances were before the ninth inning, but they were both fine. I think he's back in a pretty comfortable spot. I I think all season long we might see Seth Lugo used this way where, you know, if he's rested enough, he gets through the eighth with no problem. They just leave him out there, kind of like Josh Hader was handled by the Brewers before he became their their actual closer. Uh, I, I think we could see that a lot from Lugo this year, but I still expect Diaz to get the most saves there. Brad Hand picked up his fourth save of the season, one walk and two strikeouts. James Karinchak pitched the eighth inning once again with one hit and one strikeout. It's Brad Hand's job for now, but I, I don't think that he has a long leash. If he blows one or two saves, I think we see Karinchak in that role, especially the way that Karinchak has pitched so far this season. I, I think we might be, I think you might be, Uh-oh. Frank, Uh-oh. underestimating just... <laughs> who Brad Hand is and how good he's been the past four years. Uh, last last outing, his velocity was fine. It was all the way back. It was back down again this outing. Look back to last year, early on, his velocity was pretty low too. He's not a high-velocity guy to begin with. And, like, he's been getting lots of strikeouts. So, you know, last four years, Hand has a 275 ERA, 109 whip, 12.2K per nine. I know we're all excited about James Karinchak and what he could bring to the table, but it would be an upset if he's as good as Brad Hand's been the past four years. So, like, let's just root for Hand to keep the job, and I think he has a good chance of doing it. No, we're not going to root for that because I don't have any shares of Brad Hand, Scott, and it's all about me. <laughs> I, I don't really have much uh, Karinchak either, uh, but... Uh, no, Brad Hand has been very good. There's no doubt about it. I'm just saying, like, yeah. when you have someone this good behind you, it's a little bit of wishful thinking. All right. What is? The Which Karen one? check thing for, for, for Frank. It's uh, a little bit like, I want this to happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why not? I mean, he's, he's awesome to watch. By the way, Kenley Jansen just got bailed out from blowing a save. He has a league high four saves, but uh, should have been a blown save. I like it. It could still happen with Karin check, obviously. Uh, any closer is a bad week away from losing his job. But I, I feel pretty confident in Brad Hand right now, I guess is all I'm trying to say. I feel more confident than I did a week ago. Yeah. I feel more confident in Anthony Bass, who has been pretty much lights out for Toronto since he's taken over the role. He did allow a walk and a hit in a one-run game today, but he converted the saves for Toronto. Josh Hader had a clean ending for the save against the White Sox. Joaquin Soria 
1.2 innings pitch tonight, picked up the save, entering um, Wednesday night's action. Liam Hendricks had pitched three of the last four games for Oakland. I don't really think there's much to see there with Soria, but he's likely the next man up if something were to happen to Hendricks. And then Trevor Gott, always trying to figure out the uh, the Gabe Kapler bullpen. He pitched a clean ninth inning in Colorado, picked up the save in a one-run game. So Trevor Gott looks... He looks like the guy, Scott, for now. I think this is a much more straightforward situation than we were led to believe and and that we've probably been stating here. He has all three of the Giants' saves. The one time he didn't work the ninth inning, he worked the eighth inning against the heart of the Rangers' lineup. So at the very least, he's he's the pitcher Gabe Kapler trusts the most. That was against a couple lefties, too. And he's a right-hander, obviously. Tony Watson has yet to throw in the ninth inning. Tyler, Tyler Rogers has been terrible. You got to hold today, but for the most part, he's been terrible. Like who else is it going to be? It's it's there will be weird times when he comes in in the eighth instead of the ninth. But Trevor Gott is clearly the guy to have in the Giants bullpen. I think Joe Jimenez, Trevor Gott, Anthony Bass. Welcome to 2020, people. We're going to wrap it up there. For Scott and Chris, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today on our YouTube channel. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.